Yeah, welcome everyone to Science Society and of course a special welcome to you here. Um, thank you so much for you know joining, making the account and everything. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. And um, so that everyone will uh, get to know you a little bit better, I'll um, give some, some background information. Mm -hmm and uh, we'll go from there. So, um, uh, Dr. Gutami Sompali, I hope I said that right, um, she is at the, in computer science at the University of Maryland, College Park, and in Professor Tom Goldstein's lab. And um, her re broader research, um, in her broader research, she focuses um, at the intersection of machine learning and computer vision with the aim of building practical machine learning systems that are interpretable and robust. And um, she has been working on developing novel deep learning architectures for uh, different um, domains, such as um, images, graphs, to um, tables, to tools to explain and analyze that success and failure of models of common deep mo learning models. And she received uh, different, you know, awards and fellowships. And one of them was the um, Cole Carney Fellowship. Um, and before she started her PhD, she worked in the industry for eight years on various product and engineering roles. Um, and she received her bachelor's from the IIT in Madras. And um, yeah, and you know, she published various papers in, in, in really great journals. And uh, as I said, she, she presented her work also at Google Research India and received a bunch of um, fellowships. So it's such an honor and pleasure having you here today. And um, Victoria usually ask a few interview questions before we dive deep into your research. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Katarina. And once again, Gautami, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for friends who are here. And also thank you for friends of the future who will be listening to the replays and all the places that you might find them. So we'd, we'd love to hear a bit more about you before we hear about your research. And what I'm wondering is if you can think of a time in your life when you felt or noticed the spark of interest that drew you towards science. And this can be anywhere in your lifetime, childhood, or anywhere through your education. So thank you. Um. Okay, science, science in, in general, like, uh, so, uh, I mean, like, uh, from, from the childhood, like, uh, in my family, the, we, we are very math and uh, science oriented sort of people, like, uh, like my grandfather had, like, masters in, in physics, uh, I mean, like, which was kind of, uh, very few people had that, like, back in those days. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say, like, I have always been interested in science, uh, and, uh, uh, like, uh, Katrina mentioned, like I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering, uh, and after that, like I worked in industry for a few years, uh, where I was like not really doing any sort of uh, very hands-on engineering stuff, but uh, I was mostly into management and all. But then I started up, uh, I had a startup, and we were like a small team, and that's where I got my hands dirty and uh, got into like computer science and machine learning to uh, like for the first time and. And then that's when I felt like uh, it's it's quite exciting, and I I did not know so much about it. Like I was doing mostly applied stuff at the time, and then I got like very curious about like how these models work and so on. So yeah, after uh, I mean like we ran the startup for like a few years, and we kind of like wrapped it up. Uh, after that, I felt like uh, I mean. Uh, uh, my friends, most of them suggested like, okay, you should be doing MBA at this point. <laughs> Your profile is perfect for it. But then I felt like, okay, I, I don't feel like I, I would be happy doing an MBA. Like I, I think like a PhD is something probably uh, which will give me time to understand uh, more about machine learning and deep learning and 
yeah, that, that's how I landed in like University of Maryland. Um, yeah, doing yeah, like uh, deep learning stuff. Thank you. It sounds like you are really comfortable listening to your own your own intuition to where you you want it to go. And then can maybe you can take us on a step by step with big steps um, journey of how you arrived at the current research that you're doing today. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I mean, like uh, I I would say in the beginning I was not very sure about like what I what sort of problems I should be working on. Like uh, if you, if you look at uh, uh, most of the people like uh, who start with PhD, they kind of uh, already come with like certain problems in mind. But uh, for me, like I. I came as like a blank slate and I was sort of open to any problem which interests me. So yeah, I kind of uh, uh, worked with like a few profs and and the good thing about University of Maryland is like most of the courses were like, um, uh, like project oriented. So it gave me an opportunity to work on a bunch of projects without uh, I mean, having to invest so much time because like uh, they were all mostly group projects. And uh, yeah, that kind of uh, got me like, uh, I mean, I was able to do like a lot of stuff, like uh, a few vision projects, language projects and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, I mostly ended up like, I, I guess like a couple of years back, um, when I was kind of working on certain models, uh, I realized like reproducibility was sort of an issue. Like I train a model with one seed and then I get like correct answer, uh, correct prediction. Uh, and then next time I kind of train it again and I kind of get wrong prediction. Like there's so much uncertainty involved in, in the deep learning models, right? Like, uh, I mean, there's so many hyperparameters, like every time you change something, you end up like uh, at a different local minima. So, uh, so that kind of, uh, yeah, like got me thinking about like okay how can we understand this reproducibility issue so that's where i worked on um that's what i did for like uh, last year uh and where where i published a paper at cvpr uh, where we were trying to understand the reproducibility and quantify the reproducibility in different deep learning architectures um yeah and i kind of so so say after that uh, i was kind of working slightly uh, in that area but then diffusion models kind of blew up this year and uh, sorry last year and i i kind of like started reading about them slowly and and then i mean that everybody mostly focused on trying to improve their diffusion models or like trying to find like this little trick which make them work for like something else uh but at, at the same time there are like a lot of discussions about like a diffusion model just copying from the training data uh, uh, is that why the generations are really good like so this question has been going around but nobody has an answer for it so that's when we we thought like uh, my, my advisor and i we were kind of discussing about it and and then we decided okay fine why don't we like try to answer this question so yeah that's how i ended up doing this project and uh, yeah it's been a journey it's a very interesting project it's it's technically not an efficient project it's actually i would say like uh, uh, is a retrieval project, but uh, I, but it, it, um, yeah, but we found like very interesting results. Like, yeah, that's how I ended up with this. I hope that answered your question. Oh, it, it did. It did in a very interesting way too. It's, it will be interesting to hear about how you quantified your observations. I have a question though. Can you please repeat the last thing that you said? You said that it wasn't really this, it's more of that. And I missed both of those words. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, I was saying it was not exactly like a, a generative modeling project, like, but it's more of a retrieval project. That uh, That's what I said. Um, I mean, because like uh, we are kind of not training, I mean, we are training diffusion models technically, but we are not trying to improve a diffusion model. We are just using the diffusion model and we are actually using like uh, retrieval methods to understand the replication. So yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Okay, thank you. I'm glad I asked you because maybe um, somewhere along your discussion, you could define the difference between those two examples for our oh. listeners. And and um, so, you know, if not now, then whenever it works for you. And at this point, I will hand you the mic and say the stage is yours and you're welcome to go into your discussion. And Katarina has your PDF up pinned and then at the end of your discussion we can help with um, you to have a q a and if anybody types any questions to you in the chat then we'll also share those with you so you don't have that on your mind just enjoying your talk 
Sure. Um, yeah, I I just have a quick question. Um, I mean, should I should I mention like every time uh, I change the slide number, just mention which slide I'm talking about? Sure. Uh, yes, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just before I get started, like, feel free to interrupt me uh, if somebody has like a burning question or, uh, yeah, if there is any question in the chat as well, like, because I would rather have more sort of a discussion sort of a session rather than like me kind of lecturing people. Okay, got it. I heard okay. you. All right. Can cool. you um, questions? Uh, send them on. Sure. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so this paper, uh, the paper I'm going to discuss today is uh, titled Diffusion Art or Digital Forgery, Investigating Replication and Diffusion Models. And uh, uh, this paper has been accepted to CUPR this year. And uh, if we can move to slide number two. Uh, so uh, diffusion models are just, just to give like an extremely high level pitch is uh, diffusion models are generative models where you start from a Gaussian noise and, uh, and then you go through this diffusion model and you end up with a realistic looking image. And uh, technically how they train it is uh, there is a forward process and a backward process where in the forward process, you start from a realistic a real image and uh, you slowly progressively add some sort of a Gaussian noise in every step till uh, till end steps where it ends up looking almost like a isotropic Gaussian noise. And uh, in the reverse process, what happens is we start from this Gaussian noise and try to get the image back. So that's how we train the model. And uh, during the inference, uh, uh, we completely forget about the forward step. Uh, we randomly sample uh, uh, a noise from this Gaussian and, and then we kind of like progressively denoise it till we like get a realistic looking image. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, third slide. Um, and uh, I, I would want to just say this. So a perfect generative model should never output a, a training sample. So uh, in all the machine learning models or generative models, like what we want the model to do is uh, to produce realistic looking images, but it should not remember the training data. So, uh, I mean, if it's remembering the training data, it's not a very good generalized, uh, generalized model, okay? Um, okay, fourth slide. Um, so I asked this question, um, do you think diffusion models copy? Uh, so fourth slide, short answer is yes. Um, I mean, like I would not be presenting here if they're not copying at all. Uh, so in, in this uh, fifth slide, I show some examples with, which we found uh, in stable diffusion 1.4. Uh, where on the first row, we see the generations from the stable diffusion where we have provided the caption. And uh, on, on the second row, we see the, the closest looking match in the Lyon aesthetics uh, six plus train data, uh, which sta stable diffusion is uh, fine tuned on, like in the later stages of the training. Uh, so as you can see, uh, all these images, uh, whether the, all these generation and the match pairs, uh, they all sort of exhibit different properties. Like the first uh, first column, if you see like only the background is being copied, the, the woman in the picture is completely different. The dress she's wearing is different, but the background is kind of recycled. Similarly, in the second image, we see the couch and the wall is kind of recycled. However, the wall painting has changed. Uh, and in third and fourth columns, we see the image has been reconstructed. Uh, more or less everywhere, except it's it has reconstructed it poorly uh, by missing out or changing some details. So, um, so these are a few examples we found in our study. And uh, uh, so, in sixth slide, okay, what is what do we count as replication? So, um, okay, when you when you go in seventh slide, uh, when I mean like there can be multiple levels of replication, right? Like uh, let's say we have this. Uh, query image of this dog and uh, you can you can go like exact copy of the same image till the semantic copy like we as long as a, there is a dog in the picture you can also call it a copy however that one is a semantic copy uh, and on the left end of the spectrum we have perceptual copy where each even pixel level details are exactly the same between the query image and the match image. Um, so uh, this is kind of, you can say like the scale of replication. And uh, in eighth slide, I will, I mean, uh, the highlighted area is kind of what we kind of looked at, where we look at 
perceptual end of the spectrum where we are looking at pixel level copies of the query image uh, and also we are okay with the kind of copies where there are certain changes have been made like for example there is a style copy or a flip of an image or zoomed in version of the query image or maybe um, maybe like uh, we the query image has been added into a collage of like some other larger image so these these are the kind of uh, copies we we were we tried to find in this study um okay so uh in in the ninth slide um i asked this question like uh, if we can use any of the current methods and uh in the 10th slide uh so there are a few current methods where we can actually find perceptual copies however they are very limited for example uh, we have this instance retrieval or copy detection sort of techniques where uh, they are looking for the exact copies where uh, you, they, they do not forgive a slight changes in the query image, like the match image, like it has to be like pixel level of copying. Um, and and then we have like self-supervised and uh, supervised pre-trained uh, pre models uh, where you can get the features from these models and then you can use them as uh, to, to do the dot product similarity and kind of find the matches. but uh these techniques are not actually trained for um for retrieval sort of tasks so uh what we did in our paper um okay actually before we go there uh okay in the 11th slide i kind of uh, show some examples of the current data sets which are out there um so they're mostly for the instance retrieval sort of tasks where um where like uh you have to match to the exact same image. Um, so what we found is uh, in the slide 13, I say like, okay, there are no partial retrieval data sets in the wild. Uh, like for example, if if we, okay, if we go to slide number 12, like the, the center image where the dog is sitting on a bench, uh, that kind of uh, uh, tasks are not there in, I mean, the current benchmarks don't account for that kind of matches, like uh, uh, where the query dog is on the left left end dog and and the match is the dog sitting on the bench sort of tasks. So uh, so for that, like if you go to slide number 14, uh, we actually curated synthetic data sets uh, where uh, uh, we have like this ground truth image, uh, like, like for example, let's look at the first row uh this this cat is there right like uh, this is an image from uh coco data set uh so coco data set has like images as well as uh, pixel level annotations of the class and uh, so what we did is like extracted this cat cat patch and pasted it on top of this bench or sort of um some other background and now we consider this uh this cat image which is ground truth uh, and and then the cat stuck on this bench as the potential matches. So this kind of, uh, uh, it's like a proxy task for the partial matches. So similarly, we have done like some other um, uh, artificial data set we have created where we have done like a diagonal in painting or patch level out painting and so on. Uh, okay, uh, essentially, like if you go to slide number 15, uh, yeah, so what we have done so far is we have this bunch of real data sets and which account for uh, like instance copies. Uh, and and then uh, we also curated like a bunch of synthetic data sets which can account for like partial sort of copying. And then what all we did is we have taken a bunch of uh, current methods, uh, deep learning methods and benchmarked them against these data sets and uh, we found and then this way like we shortlisted like few uh few uh, deep learning architectures um which we are going to use for like the rest of the study uh for example like uh, if you see in the slide number 15 sscd and swain transformer and dino these three tech three these three architectures seem to be like really good at performing they, they perform really well in all the 10 data sets we studied at um so yeah that's that's what we have done like in the first part of the paper essentially we wanted to find a good feature extractor where which we can use to study replication in the diffusion models um okay uh any questions so far i'm i'm sorry like uh, it became very technical <laughs> 
think so far, let me check. I think so far we're good. Unless Steve, do you came up to the stage? Do you want to ask a question? I'm fine so far. Yeah, maybe maybe we can continue. Uh, okay, sounds good. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Um, we can just go to slide. I actually seven. had a question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. So, um, just for curiosity, I just joined the room. So, uh, it's uh, uh, so the premise is that these um. Uh, Art, whether it's copying the uh, an image and uh, you know how's it copying. So the talk is around that, I guess. Um, what I was gonna ask is, are these resistant to adversarial attacks? Um, um, but maybe okay. it's out of context. Maybe it's not relevant for what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, I mean, like we haven't really studied like adversarial attacks angle we were mostly um i mean like literally we are we were the first ones kind of studying this question so we had to set like the stage and uh yeah we haven't looked at look the, the that sort of edge cases like in this paper gotcha gotcha yeah, yeah also no if i can interject um you're welcome to browse through the pdf you said that you just joined so um yeah. you know you might wait and see what happens but you're welcome to browse the PDF and and um, you know save questions for after you've heard a bit more as well and we'll turn it back over to our guests. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Like uh, we can we can just go to the slide number seventeen. Um, okay. So at this point, all we have is a good feature extractor which can potentially find copies at least like. Uh, on the academic benchmarks as well as the synthetic data sets we have curated. Um, so, okay, in the next part of the project, what we have done is, first of all, we wanted to understand, can they even copy? Uh, that means like, are they even capable of copying? So uh, for that study, what we have done is we have taken a small data set, like uh, we, we have taken like Celebe HQ uh, data set, which has like 30,000 images. And we have trained the model, like a DDPM model, on on varying amounts of data from the Celebe data set. Uh, uh, we have trained like uh, essentially three diffusion models, one with just 300 examples, uh, 300 uh, training data points. And the second model we trained with 3000 and the third, the third model is like trained on the whole data set, which is 30,000 points. Um, so yeah, if you can go to slide number 18, uh, here we actually present the results uh, for the images generated on each of these three models and their closest matches in the training data. So if you see like, uh, for, for example, the first row cluster uh, is like the model strain three images from the model trained on 300 images. And if you see the closest matches from using each of these feature extractors like SSED or Dino or SWEN, uh, you, we, we are actually able to find exact similar looking images from the training data. And and then similarly, the second row cluster, uh, the model trained on 3000 images, uh, we, we also observed like there has been the blatant copying uh, where the model, uh, like the generations are very, very similar to training data. However, it started to make slight changes. Like for example, the third row in the, in 3000 images cluster, uh, if you see, if you look at the women's, uh, lips carefully uh, generated uh, image has like the, the lip color is like lower I mean like a darker I don't know like very light pink however uh, in the training data her lips are like dark red so that means like the model is actually starting to make changes to the training data it's not blatantly remembering it and uh, when you move on to like uh, the model trained on all 30,000 images uh, so now now you don't see copies anymore uh, you start seeing like similar looking people, but not the same people. They are not the same people. Um, so, so from this experiment, uh, uh, okay. So these are some qualitative results. So, but we need to understand, is it a, a population level behavior? So for that, if you move to slide number 19, um, so we have like three histograms, which show uh, the similarity scores between the generated images and the closest, uh, closest like training data point. We just plotted these similarity scores. 
um and uh, and and then if you look at plot number uh, plot a for 300 points uh, the model trained on 300 points you see the similarity similarity histogram is like extremely towards right that means similarity scores are like really high the, that uh, essentially means like the model is copying a lot of images from the training data and then when you when you look at the central center part of the plot with 3000 points here the gray cluster started moving towards the center so that means the model is remembering less and less. And as you look at like uh, all points plot, uh, here the, the, the gray cluster is almost aligned with the green, green histogram. So green histogram is nothing but like how, how similar the training images are with each other. Uh, so it, it, it essentially like aligns with uh, the training data. And, uh, and, and this, this kind of says like the amount of copying has a completely um, I mean, I wouldn't say disappear, but uh, it has drastically reduced the most likely they no copies exist in this third model. Uh, so what what does this tell us like uh, so this kind of tells us like when when a diffusion model has been trained on a really small data set, it is capable of remembering those points. Um, and as you kind of uh, train start training the model on larger and larger data sets like it perhaps stops copying. So that's what the conclusion is from this experiment. So uh, if you if you move on to slide number twenty, uh, so our next experiment was we try to understand like okay, so do diffusion models don't copy on larger data sets? Um, that was the question. So the next best next bigger model for us is the model trained on ImageNet, which has um, which is trained on thousand classes with the thousand images each. Uh, so uh, it's around like 1 million images the model is trained on and uh, we we use like latent diffusion model uh, we, off the shelf model like uh, we didn't have uh, a capability to train these large models at that time and uh, if you can go to slide number 21 uh, uh, okay in this very complicated looking plot all I was trying to say is like uh, we looked at uh, a lot of classes and uh, and then even the uh, so if you if you look at the left side of the plot the red color thing it's the curtain class it's an image from the curtain class and uh, and the le the left image is the generation and the right image is the closest image from the training data and as you can see these two are very similar looking but they are not exactly the same so uh, at, so we looked at like multiple other classes as well and what we found out is um, in this model there there is absolutely no copying so um, that means like the model can generalize really well to larger training data. And uh, th this kind of uh, corroborates with what we found in the, in the previous experiment as well. So at this point, uh, we were mostly thinking, okay, I guess like uh, there is more or less no copying in large scale diffusion models. Uh, so yeah, but, but uh, unfortunately they do. And uh, uh, so if you can, move on to slide number 24. Um, so we, what we found is uh, uh, after that, after the ImageNet experiment, we have moved on to stable diffusion and uh, where we, we started evaluating whether the copying exists in stable diffusion or not. And we found so many instances of uh, like blatant complete copying or partial copying exists in the, in the images generated by stable diffusion. Uh, and uh, okay, and for that, like uh, if you can go to slide number 25, uh, I show the experimental setup here. Uh, so what we have done is uh, we have taken stable diffusion 1.4. Uh, so uh, like right now we are in stable diffusion 2.1, I think, but the 1.4 was the model at the time when when we were writing this paper. And uh, uh, we, this model is trained on like Lion 2 billion images and it's fine tuned on Lion Aesthetics V5. Uh, which has like around 400 million images. However, um, like with, I mean, I, but we can't, we couldn't evaluate against all 2 billion images. Like we literally could not hold it in our small academic cluster. I mean, we couldn't even hold like around four, 400 million images as well. So what we did is uh, we kind of compared against only like the Lion A V6 plus subset, which has only 12 million images. And uh, and then we generated around 10,000 images from random captions coming from the Lion dataset itself. So the setup is 10,000 generations compared against 12 million images. Um, okay, so 
so technically we are actually come looking for replication in a smaller subset of the whole training data okay uh, slide number 26 uh, so this is actually the number we have estimated uh, which could be a potential copy like around 1.88 percent of our 10,000 generations are sort of uh, potential copies uh, okay if you can go to slide number 27 uh, so there are like couple of uh, I mean like the from the way you look at it this number could be like a lower bound or an upper bound lower bound in the sense like we looked we searched against only the smaller subset of the whole training set or uh, it could be upper bound as well because uh, all the 10,000 images we have generated are coming like the captions are coming exactly from the training data and those might not be the captions people use like while while using the stable diffusion like in real life so um yeah like uh, you have to keep that in mind like when you're looking at this number uh okay in slide 28 um we kind of uh, try to understand and analyze what what these copies are uh, so, for example, if you look at this uh, slide number 28, uh, we have like two, the generation and, uh, and the training image look very similar, except they have this uh, wall painting with changes. And also, if you look at uh, the caption, which is used for this generation, which says Hill Country Castle by R.D. Angel, and, and then look at the caption of the match in the training data, uh, which is Ben Hogan portrait, something, something. There's absolutely no caption match. Like you would assume, okay, the model might be uh, copying from the, uh, sorry, copying images when when that particular caption appears. But here there is absolutely no caption dependence. Like they, the generation and the match have like completely different captions, but still they look the same. Uh, similarly, if you go to slide number 29, uh, we have uh, a generation and lion uh, match which look very similar except for this small portion of the phone case who's uh, where the in the graphic changes mm, here also the caption captions are very different uh, however like uh, when you go to slide number 30 uh, uh, here the images both uh, like look slightly different like for example if you pay attention to the weapons like this man is holding they are kind of different between the generation and the match and however and, and also we see like uh, the keyword here is Bloodborne, um, which is uh, the name of the video game. So this this word Bloodborne kind of elicited the copying behavior in the diffusion model. Uh, similarly, like uh, if you go to slide number thirty one, uh, okay, thirty one. Uh, here also there is a strong caption dependence. Like for example, on the first row, we see like whenever some you use like canvas wall art print, this particular key phrase and and then. Yeah, you give any description of the wall art, like around 20% of the time we found like this couch has been replicated. And similarly, like the wave, uh, the wave is the key phrase for generating this uh, painting, this this style of wave, like uh, as you can see in the second row. Um, so, so yeah, we have, we have seen like a bunch of these examples, like uh, where there is no caption dependence and then uh, a lot of examples where there is a caption dependence. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, in slide number 32, like, uh, yeah, I kind of have a post note, like uh, where we noticed that like certain phrases and, and words can trigger the copying. Not, you don't necessarily need like the whole caption. Uh, the captions don't have to be like the exact same words. They can be like close enough in the latent space, like uh, in the text latent space for the model to elicit like this sort of copying behavior. Um, okay, in uh, slide number 30 33, I show a few examples. So this one is uh, is not a, it's, it's a, it's completely qualitative experiment. We were kind of curious about like uh, uh, the amount of replication which are happening with these famous artworks. And um, as you can see, like uh, like we looked at around 20 paintings by famous artists and uh, they, they have been like, there is a replication spectrum. Like uh, for example, the Starry Night uh, by Vincent Van Gogh, uh, the generation looks very, very similar to the original painting while, uh, well, uh, we we were looking at some painting by um i think uh alfonso mucha uh on on the right side like a second from the right side like second uh the 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 style has been copied but the content has changed 
a lot. So, so uh, as you can see, like, I mean, we don't have the quantitative numbers for quantifying like the style copying, but uh, we noticed that the model is capable of copying style as well, not necessarily the complete whole image. Um, okay, so um, in slide number 34, like uh, we, we kind of put out like what our hypothesis is at this point, like why this copying behavior might be happening. So the most uh, famous hypothesis, like everybody kind of uh, says like data duplication is the reason for this sort of uh, copying behavior, which we kind of agree as well. Like, uh, and I mean, it uh, like there has been evidence, like as you can see, like in stable diffusion 2.1, um, the amount of copying has definitely reduced. Like uh, there are few examples, which we showed in our paper, like uh, they don't work anymore on stable diffusion 2.1, where they have deduplicated Lyon heavily and uh, trained the model on it. Uh, however, there are a few examples uh, where the, the the copying is still happening. Like for example, the the um, in in slide thirty one, uh, if you go back, like uh, the canvas wall art print. So that image, that couch, still gets copied in stable diffusion two point one. And in fact, like at least I felt like the copying has increased in stable diffusion two point one. Like uh, for this couch especially. Um, so for that, like uh, we are kind of uh, we believe like text conditioning could be the one of the major culprit behind this copy copying behavior as well as uh, we could see like with the partial partial match of phrases also like this uh, copying is happening right like so that's what made us believe like text conditioning could be a reason for it and uh, i'm actually kind of working on it right now to try to uh, like systematically study the effect of text conditioning on the replication behavior um okay yeah uh, yeah that kind of concludes my presentation uh, yeah uh, all right, so any questions or if you're unclear about anything, just uh, ask me which slide you want me to go to. I can just go through it again. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, VTR, go ahead. Yeah, they, um, <clears throat> sorry, thank you. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I had a question regarding, first question is the troubleshooting aspect. Now, so there's the the working hypothesis right now is that this is this sort of copying is caused by the captioning right so this is based on the analysis that you did yeah uh, if it doesn't turn out to be the case then how do you go about troubleshooting because you know as you know these systems are black boxes right so I know I don't want you to think that right now because it's like I don't want to think make you think ahead of that but like just trying to get a general sense of uh, what techniques are you using to kind of uh, come up with hypothesis for what could be going on in these uh, models. Um, yeah so uh, I mean like text conditioning um, is uh, something I'm working with right now, and we are we are actually seeing good results there. Like, uh, hopefully, we'll uh, put out a preprint pretty soon. Uh, I mean, I don't want to discuss that right now without uh, uh, without uh, putting out a paper first. Uh, but um, I mean, like, I would say, uh, I mean, so we like like you said. I mean, I wouldn't say these diffusion models are complete black boxes, but we definitely don't know how the text or uh, how the images are kind of interacting with each other. Yeah, we understand they're doing by a cross attention, but we don't know like uh, exactly what is causing the replication behavior, like um, like you said. Um, but uh, yeah, from all the examples we have looked at, uh, um, like, like I said, there are uh, around 200 images, which were like uh, very, very um, similar to the training data. And we were kind of systematically trying to understand like, okay, what could be the reason for it? And we found like, caption is one major factor across most of these examples. Uh, so that's the reason why we started working towards that hypothesis. And we believe like uh, that's a that's a good direction and and deduplication along with the uh, text conditioning could completely solve this sort of uh, um, replication problem. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Steve, do you have a question now, please? Yeah, I think maybe I have two questions. So uh, I'll ask one by one, uh, mm -hmm. so you don't have to remember. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. The first one is uh, on page three. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so you said that a perfect generative model uh, almost never output a training sample. Um, to me, you know, the the output is discrete, right? Uh, images are just uh, you know integer numbers, uh, and uh, but it's massive. So mm -hmm. in theory, uh, you know, a, a generative model, even a perfect generative model, uh, is not prohibited to generate yeah. a, a training sample. That means you know it, it is possible to mm -hmm. generate a, a training sample. So uh, yeah, so I I would just want to know your thoughts you know uh when you uh there for this statement That's yeah yeah question. i yeah i know um it's kind of uh uh it, i mean like you said the, it is it, the the more images we are generating are definitely discrete but uh, um i mean if you Okay, if you, if you look at this, like uh, think think of it this way: in a diffusion model, we are going from in in image to a random uh, Gaussian sample, right? So that means like um, um, I I mean just think of it like a kind of a mapping between a training image and uh, sorry a a Gaussian noise vector and and a real image vector. So and all diffusion model is doing is kind of morphing this. Gaussian representation like noise into like a realistic looking image. So technically, uh, I mean, if the model is like really learning, uh, the chances of actually sampling whatever the training, uh, the, the noise which is connected to the training sample is is very, very, very low. However, uh, if if you kind of can sample like infinite number of images and do generations, of course, you will find copies. Right, I think you know this is more like a probability argument, right? When, yeah. Yeah. So you know, uh, it, because it's discrete, so you know, uh, my thought is, you know, it, it has an uh, absolutely a, a a above zero probability to output training samples. But you know, when the training data gets bigger and bigger, that probability will reduce, and that seems uh, verified by your first uh, experiments that when you change the you know the, the celebration celebrity celebrity uh, mm -hmm. uh, setup right and that mm -hmm. seems you know confirm you know, it's it's more like a probability argument yeah. uh, instead of saying you know it uh, uh, you know uh, a perfect uh, you know to me a perfect generative model will still output but you know that, that's just mm -hmm. my thought uh, I'm, yeah. I, it's great to have this discussion with you. Uh, may, maybe we can move on to the next one. I need help, your help to explain uh, a little bit to me. Um, so that is the um, page 19. I actually don't know uh, the page 19. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to read this uh, uh, plot. Oh. Sure, uh, sure, I'm sure. not sure how many other people uh, understood. To me, yeah, I, I don't know how to uh, it looks to me, I would say, you know, the, the, on the uh, far right side, that seems to be have more copy, um, but it seems your conclusion is the opposite. So, so I, I definitely have some misunderstanding how to interpret this plot. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. could you explain, sure. explain yeah, this yeah. one to me again? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so basically, like, uh, uh, in, in this plot, what we are trying to understand is how the similarity scores are kind of varying across different diffusion models. Uh, when I say similarity score, uh, think of it this way, like I have one generation and uh, and then I kind of try to find the closest match in the training data. And then I get like a score between zero and one for that uh, closest gen, like of uh, image from the training data, right? Like, uh, so maybe my, my score is like 0.9. So similar, if I if I do this again and again for like a lot of generated images. So in this example, I think like we did around 5,000 generations. Uh, so we kind of uh, did a bunch of generations and then tried to find the similarity scores with respect to the training data, the highest similarity score for any given generation. And uh, we plotted those uh, in the green, sorry, in the gray color plot. Um, so we did the same thing for all three models. And uh, so uh, for 300 points model, uh, most of the similarity scores are to the right side. That means they're very, very similar to the one, one training example. So that, that's what it is saying. Like this gray 
gray mass moving towards the center means like they're they're not very very similar to the training data anymore oh i see yeah i, I was kind of reading the similarity between the distribution but instead you know closing to one means uh, uh you know replication yeah yeah uh, okay, so the, th the thing is like uh, this this replication itself is a very abstract concept like we don't have like very good measures for it we could only um how, how to say like we don't have exact cutoff like when is what is the right cutoff for us to say like it's a copy so so that's why we were kind of studying like more of a population level behaviors yeah cool yeah thank you so much yeah. so i have a follow-up uh, so Steve mentioned this interesting thing about the discrete, you know, uh, input that it takes. So um, I, you know, I've in the camp that ML systems are blind to anything they haven't seen before, right? So until you are trained, if the training data contains those images, it's going to have aspects of that being represented somehow and there you cannot have an ideal generative kind of state um, and so because you know when humans look at images they understand what's happening in a scene the context all mm -hmm. of that that gets lost in the purely statistical way for analyzing and and producing these artifacts so um, but yeah, I would love to know your thoughts because this is like basically they they are being trained on the this data set. So uh, eventually there is some you know the hope of the research community is that something something will emerge if we train it enough. But I don't think so. That that's what it's trained on, and that's what's gonna uh, try to mimic most of the times. Uh, uh, so yeah. I, it's limited in that regard. Um, okay, I mean, like, uh, okay, I, 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 I mean, like, I, I don't have a very good answer for this. Like, I, I don't even know what the answer for this is. I will just give my opinion. Um, I mean, like, one thing I have noticed about diffusion models is, uh, yeah, that's kind of true. Like, we there are only like limited number of pixels for any given dimension image and there are only limited number of images uh, and if you have large enough data set like perhaps there might be some sort of copying uh, but but what i have observed is like they have been um, so so for example if you take the ddim model you can actually trace back like you can get the noise uh, for any given image as well like and then when you do interpolation between like uh, let's say two realistic images corresponding noise vectors of two realistic image looking images uh, and and they're really interpolating really well that means like uh, even though the points on this line even though the model has never seen them before but but it's it's able to like interpolate well or actually understand the image space well at least well compared to like the previous generation of generative models um yeah uh, i mean like i i'm i'm not saying like they're not they're not coming up with like completely new they're not coming up with like completely new which they have never seen before i'm not saying that but they seem to be like be able to combine uh different co like they're able to compose images really well comparatively uh yeah did did that mm -hmm. i mean did that make sense <laughs> yeah yeah it totally makes sense and I'm, i i kind of know this and, and it, this is a you know, it's not a, it's been the problem in AI has been this like this for years. And we are able to do these uh, as a result of like massive compute that we have in on our hands. Um, so yeah, those, those are fair. And uh, in fact, didn't the stable diffusion just got sued from Getty images. So your hunch is probably correct because it's copying and, and so they I don't know if that's related, but they did did got a lawsuit um, for from Getty Images because they were yeah, using yeah. them for training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so basically, like, um, yeah, stable diffusion is, is not just stable diffusion in general. Uh, diffusion models are kind of uh, very good at like partial replication also. Uh, 
um i mean like for example that couch image i keep showing everywhere so uh, it yeah it's kind of famous couch in my university at least at this point um so uh, this the, if you if you can see like there are like a lot of training images with this couch but with the art being changed like for perhaps they scraped it from some 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 sort of furniture or a uh, i don't know some website like that some e-commerce website so uh, so the model is kind of interpolating really well in those wall art region and and then putting in is able to generate like a new images there but it's kind of keeping keeping this couch constant because it has seen it a lot in the training data so it there is like a huge uh, probability mass on this couch like yeah I, yeah, like English yeah, yeah. speaking. Higher so, weightage, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So perhaps like uh, they might be so stable efficient, perhaps might be like uh, training on a lot of Getty images as well. So that's why this Getty book, uh, sorry, that uh, watermark sort of thingy started showing up in some images, even though you don't explicitly ask for it because there's like perhaps a lot of them. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for those questions. Um, there was a question in the chat from Sal Zomo. He asked, "Are you developing a tool, a tool for identifying copies?" And uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, so um, we're not really developing a tool for it. This is a, more of a exploratory study to just understand uh, whether copying exists or not. And uh, like I said, like uh, there, there's still a lot of work to be done here because um, there are like multiple definitions of copying. Um, so yeah, no not tool currently at least. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And do, so, well, you presented that, um, you know, in, in, in your type of setting um, where you really, um, you know, have a really um, insight into how you basically come up uh, with these or your model comes up with these images. Is there a way to reduce uh, systematically the, the copying basically um, in the future? Or um, can we predict already kind of the amount or percentage of uh, these models just that they will always, um, you know, just copy and, and have IP issues? Uh, so, uh, like, like I mentioned, uh, there are like two particular, two, two directions. Um, I think like I would reduce like most of the copying, first of all, is uh, deduplication deduplication of the training data so um i mean like there is actually like a study by google uh, a similar paper like uh, which came in january uh those guys kind of uh, looked at like amount of data replication in lyon and it seems like some of the images are like like 10 they present ten thousand times in the training data like of course the model tries to remember them because it keeps seeing them again and again so um yeah there's like a lot of uh duplication of images in in lyon so perhaps cleaning up lyon will definitely bring down this level of replication uh and and it did actually like uh, in stable diffusion 2.1 uh at which uh, i think they trained the model on deduplicated lyon and um and then another direction is like uh, text conditioning like um like for uh, some examples i have shown where certain keywords are eliciting the copying behavior so um yeah so text conditioning like uh, we try to understand like how much how the text conditioning is impacting and and then if you can train it like a little bit robust fashion perhaps by um i don't know like adding some sort of noise in the in the text embeddings like uh, that's something i'm trying and seem to be working really well right now so yeah, yeah these are a couple of ways like uh, uh where uh we can actually reduce the copying uh in in diffusion models uh yeah these are the on two things on top of my mind, like perhaps like uh, there are more ways. I'm not uh, sure. Uh, quick question. Um, sorry to interject. Um, the sure. um, can you expand on text conditioning because if you're applying text conditioning and troubleshooting, say this particular training set, will that 
be generalized across all different training sets on all different varieties of uh, training sets like this is just one use case right like is there a generalization across the board or this is just one off <clears throat> um okay uh so okay l- let me put it this way so the if you if you train a diffusion model um per- perhaps like uh, well, like like I, i have showed like in my presentation image net uh which is like class conditional and uh, uh so the amount of copying there is like very very low um so uh, however the stable diffusion is actually a text conditioning model like where you have like this clip clip uh which is giving out this text vector and then we are kind of conditioning uh the generation using that right like so uh yeah there are like slightly different methods and we feel like text conditioning could be like a, one of the big bigger culprits which is responsible for the replication uh but uh, i i i mean i would i would say like um yeah data duplication will completely solve class conditional or or no conditioning sort of diffusion models for text condition diffusion models like uh, uh like some more a little bit augmentations in the text conditioning or s- sort of things might uh, alleviate this issue like on top of deduplication Mm-hmm. So, so, so you, um, uh, you envision the it would generalize across different uh, data sets and um, the or diffusion will handle data sets with less it, duplication it, with yeah with test, yeah yeah, okay. yeah perceptual copying will de- definitely disappear uh, uh, but uh, but there is still this issue of style copying and uh, studying style is a very very hard problem. and uh, yeah i'm mean, like we just started looking at it uh, but i would say like uh, it's it's more of a a subjective matter rather than an objective mm-hmm. matter like perceptual copying so um, yeah i i i don't think like the, the the models might might still copy style but but the perceptual copying will will go away like uh, with few of these techniques mm-hmm. most likely in future thank you so does the copying just like how um the same is the copied image or text is it you know are there maybe like 10 pixels off and the for the model it's not a copy and it's just for our like what's the percentage of overlap or and isn't there just a way to just um say you know to um write it the to delete um images that are you know up to i don't know uh mm-hmm. 50% of pixels the same or something like that because in language models you can do that right you can uh say ignore double words that come like as close as after each 10th word or so or after each third word you know that that the model should just ignore the same word if they come let's say in a frequency of uh, one out of 10 or and so on um so so the thing is like uh, um the images are not actually that straightforward uh, i mean like uh, if you if you if you take an image and and then just shift it by one column like the first column just shift it and then if you look at the l2 distance it will be like huge so uh, and and l2 is technically the best perceptual measure out there if you if you want to look at like pixel level copying uh, but uh, uh, the, but like recently like deep learning models you can you can look at like uh, using one of these feature extractors coming out of like some of these ssl techniques uh, and then people kind of uh, use dot product similarity to see like how similar or different the images are and uh, actually lion um, sorry the stable diffusion people like i think that's how they do deduplicated they looked at like dot product similarity between like bunch of training data points and removed like similar looking images uh, but but uh, i mean perhaps they they have like a really high cutoff like if the images are exactly the same like with very very slight modifications uh very minor modifications the similarity scores are perhaps like 0.9 or something like that and i i'm not i don't know what their cutoff is 
so they they removed that those sort of duplicated images however uh, they 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 perhaps did not remove this a uh, couch kind of examples where dot product similarities won't be at the scale of like 0.9 they perhaps are at the scale of 0.6 but as a human i still find these two are very similar because it's exact same couch i mean you might be changing the painting but it's the same couch and perceptually it's a copy for me still so uh, these are kind of like a little harder problems to solve because the i mean these the, the similarity metrics won't show up like they are not like really high and they they, they did not deduplicate these sort of examples that's why uh, like this couch example which i mentioned is still appear since stable diffusion 2.1 so there you have to be like a little bit smart about it like uh, uh, there instead of like duplicating or trying to remove these images maybe look at like these phrase dependencies uh, which come uh, and 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 then yeah like uh, like i said that's where the text conditioning will play a role and remove whatever leftover duplication might be there Um, did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for explaining. Um, that's interesting. Um, it might be very different, right? Let's say from maybe an animal, if the overlap is only point six, but if a couch, yeah, I understand. So that that's a really difficult problem. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. actually a very very difficult problem. Like I mean, we. we don't know like when it stops being a perceptual copy and starts being a semantic copy like i mean for example my definition of copying might be very very different from your definition of copying right like so yeah i yeah that's it's a hard problem yeah and elon musk thinks uh, self driving is solved anyways that's a joke uh, but uh, <clears throat> yeah it's a much much harder problem and scene understanding and other things are even harder right this is just pixel to pixel differentiation and it cannot look at the entire picture overall what's happening and you can still have some duplication uh, in some yeah. way but uh, yeah. yeah 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 thank you so much um i wanted to check with you if you still have a little bit of time or if yeah you yeah sure need... sure sure yeah if i mean if there are any questions like that, i can definitely address them uh yeah Uh, please feel free to raise your hand and and come up and and join our conversation here. Um, I think it's really interesting. Also, from um, you know future legislations, I know that um, the U.S. at least started um, coming up with rules for IP related to AI. But uh, I'm not sure how how I think they are very confusing more than anything. Uh, hi, Rolf. Did you want to ask a question? Please go. Ahead. I don't know if I said your name right, Rolf Moore. Do you want to go ahead? Hey, Rolf. We can't hear you. You're on mute. Uh, yeah. If if. If it doesn't work, you could uh, share the, your question also in the chat, but we'll wait um, until you can. Um, Are you yeah. talking now, to me? Yeah, oh. now we can hear you. Uh, sorry about that. I I couldn't hear you at all. Something went wrong. Now I can hear. You, so. <laughs> uh, just saying hello. I I missed the talk, but uh, just here to listen. Could could I ask who gave the presentation at the document that's been shared? Yeah, um, go to me. Um, she she shared the talk here, um, and yeah, okay. feel free to open up the document and check out the paper. It's in the chat also. Yeah, I've been reading through it, but it's it's a bit hard without any context. Obviously, it sort of feels like just visual aid towards something that was more in depth, probably explanation. So, but I'm going to listen to the replay to uh, re review it properly. Yeah, Is is there any yeah. way maybe uh, it could be summarized your conclusion? Because I caught the tail end of your conversation. I heard that you were saying that, um, in your opinion, Gautami, that you think there is copying involved, and 
the document. I, I know it's one little slide mentions a small percentage, one point something is is considered copying. And what is there a summary, or what do you guys think is a consensus in the room? Um, yeah, I I mean like from our studies, like uh, yeah, around one point eight eight percent of the examples we looked at uh, were are potential copies. Like like I said, like they um, I mean they don't strictly follow the definition of complete image copying um, so but uh, however uh, yeah the number might be like uh, might have gone down like by a lot like uh, in I mean like we have studied like stable diffusion 1.4 but uh, uh, in stable diffusion 2.1 um, they have trained with like a lot of deduplication of the training data so perhaps this number uh, could be even smaller in the newer model um, yeah So is part of the context, I think you might have mentioned there are sort of lawsuits happening in the US, is part of the conversation in relation to that uh, debate? Um, sorry, I didn't catch your question. So I'm sure you know that there are various lawsuits happening mm -hmm. regarding, you know, whether, whether copyright is being breached and so on. And so I'm wondering if this topic of conversation is is due to those discussions or debates, uh, people having different opinions about whether this constitutes copying of, or copyright violations. Is that the context uh, here, or it, yeah, it. I mean, like we kind of started studying it before all this lawsuit stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, from your point of view, it's more of an academic exercise for the sake of its, for, just for the sake of knowledge and understanding to say, yeah. do we conceive of these as copying or not? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's completely a academic thing, like mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. not related to lawsuit. Okay. So, it, so the biggest picture to me, the one, the, the one statement that the source summarizes it in a way would be, without the data set, the output images could not be generated. Uh, to me, that's the biggest sort of big picture summary of the of the condition. So, so, so those who would argue it's a, it can constitute a new creation, I might argue against that and say you can't consider a, a new creation if you could never have been created without the source material. Mm -hmm. uh, w w do you have any opinion on that? Uh, no, I, I mean, like, uh, I, I don't have any opinion on that. And this paper is, uh, yeah, it's not, we, we are not like trying to make any statement right. about yeah. whether the models copy or not. We are just trying mm. to like, see if they are actually any copies and try to quantify them in some way. Okay. And, and uh, like I said, like, there's so many issues with like, first of all, uh, defining what it means to be a copy it's yeah. it's a very very hard problem and mm. and my definition of copying and your definition of copying could be completely different so yeah in in if you look at our paper like we kind of uh, dedicated a tiny section trying to explain what we mean by copying and what falls under our definition of copying and then try to like quantify it right yeah caught cool. again caught cool. tail end of that uh discussion here as well so interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a really interesting and, and difficult discussion because, yeah, some images look very similar. They are not 100% copies. And I think it's far easier with a text maybe than, than with the image uh, to think of what feels like a copy and what not. It's... Um, it's hard to decide. Hey, hey, John, do you want to ask a question, comment on anything? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, I sorry, I'm kind of late, so I just go, went quickly went through the uh, uh, PDF file, and I in my mind is uh, still the same. See, what constitutes a copy? Actually, copy itself is not a see a bad thing to me because in education system we always we always copy other people's uh, uh, words uh, see uh, uh, action or theory because we learn from each other 
So we are actually, we are copying other people's thoughts, other people's uh, sentence, words, ideas. We are copying all this kind of stuff. But of mm -hmm. course, well, the only thing we are, we cannot copy is you are not supposed to copy the copyrighted stuff. Then it's probably, it's not a good, a good idea. But see, in, so in this, see, in your slides, you show that roughly there's 1.88% are copied. So I don't know how do you calculate this number because basically we all copy everybody's stuff. Um, yeah, like, so this number is, I'm, like I mentioned before, this is an academic study with all, uh, where we kind of uh, define what it means to be copying. And, and then, and then we also like, looked at like only 10,000 or 9,000 generations and compared them against like a smaller subset of the training data. So, so yeah, within all these constraints, like this is the number we uh yeah that's what we found like uh within uh yeah like based on our study like this is the number we found it could be like very uh it could i mean like it could be far from the reality too like if you if you're looking at the exact copies like uh, so uh, google has done the uh a similar study where where their constraints were like extremely rigid their the, their number is like, very 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 small compared to our number so uh but uh, we are little relaxed in terms of what it means to be copy we were okay with like partial copies like where background gets copied or um maybe like a part of the image gets copied like uh so so yeah like that's why our number is like around 1.88 percent so um yeah that's that's how we came up with the number like if you look at the paper we clearly mentioned like what is our setting and how we are like measuring the copy and how how we came up with this number yeah, that should be fine as long as you define it. I think, John, um, what you you mentioned that, okay, humans copy, we all get inspired. But then the problem comes is with copyright, right? You can't, uh, we already see these lawsuits happening. So when you put out there something to sell, like when these images are getting sold for a good amount of money, then the question is different. Then Then the question is, you know, people can claim, have a claim to the original sort of art behind it. So I, I don't think that initial setup that you had or you said was relevant for what these guys have done. Uh, they are looking at a, you know, a narrow space of, okay, how many similar, similar images it's generating or copying? Uh, what is the delta? What is the, you know, not the error rate, but the duplication rate or something. So. I just actually installed uh, the stable diffusion, that program itself uh, in my computer. And I noticed that, see, in their see, so-called models or uh, see, and they claim that all the pictures in the models are see, free to use, they are not copyrighted. Yeah, but somebody used Getty images. That's not, uh, I mean, I don't even know the details of that, but uh, yeah, somebody did get sued. I, I don't know who, but uh, can try to investigate if you want. There are multiple lawsuits. One of uh, uh, one of my friends is involved in one of the class action lawsuits. She's an artist and um, many artists found their work showing up in, the, in these models that have been trained on their own artwork. So they requested to be removed. So, and they can do that. The, uh, the companies that do the models can basically allow you to opt out, which shows that's kind of a paper trail right there that they did get their data without requesting permission. One of the other sort of things that has happened, and I'm not sure which company specifically, the ones I'm most aware of are Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion, but uh, as far as I know, um, at least one of these companies acquired their original data set from a, a third party. So a European, I think German-based research company already did the, the scraping of the web. 
which they were totally legal to do as a research company because there would be there's no copyright violation if you're using data for research purposes under probably European law. But then they went and sold it for money to the AI company, and then the AI company is now prof- profiting for, from that data set. So that's where it gets murky, and part of the lawsuit is addressing that chain of title, as it were, you know, via a third party. So there appears to be a potential violation there. But not everybody's doing the same thing. Uh, Adobe has just announced their AI uh, um, application, which they say is all uh, properly acquired data sets that are, the copyright is valid. And uh, there's another partnership with NVIDIA and Shutterstock. Shutterstock is saying, well, these are all approved images for this project. So I think we're going to see a rapid uh transformation where, where more and more companies are going to be much more diligent about where they acquire the data sets and make sure there is valid uh, sign off that they, they would be then copyright free for the users. So yeah, they have I to. think we're in a transition yeah. period. Yep, they have to. Yeah, I agree. I agree they should. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting discussion I wondered if there could be a similar method, like, you know, when you write a paper and you have to cite uh, other people's work, um, you know, when you write a sentence that is based on somebody else's discoveries um, and then the citations get tracked um, and then your work basically gets valued high, higher in the ratings. For academia, it's not money-based, but I wonder if something similar, a similar system like this could be used to handle these type of accreditation for artists and then getting some sort of uh, percentage in the sale, like royalty-based. I don't know if there's an idea of doing that. A lot of people have brought that. I, I actually really like your idea that uh, when the, the, the academic analogy of the citation you're the first person i've heard mentioned it in that form the more traditional conversation has been the classic royalty based thing which is more like the licensing model that music publishing and others do uh i i think that's such a well-tested method that that could relatively easily be done but again it comes down to cost so the whole logistics and the management of that would introduce a huge overhead for the companies, which is why most of them probably just skipped because they wanted to just get there fast. And so I think uh, that would certainly be an ethical idea. Uh, I think obviously most artists would prefer the monetary <laughs> royalty system, of course, but I do like that sort of uh, status and prestige um, system in, as also an alternative, which I find fascinating as an idea. You know, it's an interesting idea, and I was thinking, so only thing is in the images, maybe the metadata has links to the prior work, and uh, I mean, that's the, I guess, uh, maybe Gautami can say more about that, but then you have to embed text in those images or like have metadata that shows all the uh, the source images and stuff like that. So um, maybe stable stable diffusion should do that on its own to avoid any lawsuits. But uh, yeah, that's one possible solution. Um, well, one thing I think stable diffusion can't avoid the lawsuits. They're already in progress, so they're going to have to deal with it one way or another. <laughs> that's the first point. Secondly. The idea of metadata, I don't believe, is currently existing in the images, but it's certainly something that a lot of NFT people brought up because that was the ideal technology in theory, where you could actually build in uh, a sort of paper trail electronically as as each uh, NFT gets transferred to the new owner. There were plan there were people doing developing that tech where there would be a completely consistent paper trail from one transaction to the next and every time it's sold on the original artist gets a, a percentage kickback to the originator of the image yeah yeah which i thought was a fantastic idea 
Nobody's really run with it. No, there is. And there nobody's is, really come. There are a couple. I oh, well, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, I interview a few companies and they, they have that uh, uh, exactly same uh, uh, royalties uh, issued. But the problem here is different. It's uh, at the source, right? Yeah. Like, so if I, I as an artist create an image, um, then put it on a blockchain, okay, that can be traced and lineage can be traced. But uh, before that, the process that took me there is where this is, this, these discussions are coming, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's never been yeah. solved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they are, I, I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard somewhere, uh, I think it was in tech news that, um, certain countries like India already using basically kind of a mark for original images uh, also to avoid you know fake news images problems you know so that you can distinguish what was um, digested basically by AI and spit out something you know like this fake arrest of of, of politicians and stuff like that I think we need that in general no I mean uh, to distinguish kind of what's the original what was you know AI generated for news I, and I don't also... know how they're gonna do that though that's the problem in digital you know you can really uh, it is a uh, whatever mark that you put like Google had a program that did that right uh digitally it's it's difficult uh, i i don't know what their claims are i haven't looked into it but it's a hard problem in computer science or you know it's it's an open problem so yeah i don't know i do know that there was an announcement during the peak of that sort of nft excitement there was quite a big announcement by a consortium like adobe microsoft maybe google few other big ones that were saying they'd started working on a new tech that would do that some sort of general watermarking that every digital image that would appear on the internet would all get watermarked so that it could always be tracked back to the originator um, but to your point I don't know how realistic that tech is and I don't know how easy it would be to hack it and remove it no idea it also brings up slightly paranoid feelings about who are they doing it for? <laughs> Is it for the government so they can trace back the, the creator of a sort of, I don't know, an anti-American meme or something and, and arrest them, you know? So I don't know where that is at, whether that's still in progress and whether they're going to solve the sort of problem of removal of that watermark. No idea where they're at. Yeah, even, you know, you can, Trace every um, trace the kind of the, the the source of every image. It the problem is still not solved. I think uh, because you know if I take a picture, I claim I'm the kind of the original owner of that image. But you know maybe I'm taking a photo of uh, some person, and that person will further you know they will need uh, uh, attribution as well. So this will go you know further down the road and. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm not seeing this will be resolved in the you know many 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 years. I I realize that there will always be tools that will be able to fudge with anything we come up with, but that's an important part of using then in the end regulations. I mean, in theory, anyone that can read and follow a cooking instructions could come with a with a bioweapon uh, or you know chemical weapon but we have regulations of accessibility of certain compounds and uh, so we kind of you know it's not allowed you go to jail for a long time and we have treaties that you know countries don't use this on each other i feel like we need um similar regulations around this because this can turn into a relatively powerful weapon as we see that you know fake news can you know overthrow whole 
governments and so on so we kind of need the to be able to trace what was actually reality and and what not i think will be really important because i think right now we are kind of at the stage like with chemical weapons in world war one um everyone is using it uh, to each other but i think in the end we will realize we will just destroy everyone <laughs> with that on a personal basis and on a higher you know governmental basis we can destroy people's lives with this and 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 politicians and governments so i don't know are you also hopeful that this will happen like a geneva convention on on you know fudging with images and stuff like that I personally am not very optimistic about any of these things because, I mean, even in, in areas of human activity where these things really, really matter, like the Geneva Conventions, all the nations have broken those conventions and flouted those laws, unfortunately. So when it comes to something as relatively trivial as, you know, authorship of an image uh, where no lives are being directly threatened, or, I, I don't see a huge motivation for governments to put a lot of resources into it. I do know there are some existing structures in place, like the, the SEC, for example, the ones who monitor crypto and money laundering and stuff like that. So some of those people are sort of interested in stuff like the NFTs being tracked and so on, but there's not a high enough level of interest, I think, to engage in a, a large amount of policing. I think the first part of your comment maybe was more interesting to me, which is more about if society opts in to a, a consensus where we all agree in, on an ethical way to behave. So if we all said we should all just be fine with the idea of image images being tracked to their author, and then if we're all on board with that, then you'd, you'd want to encourage the bigger companies to work within that framework. And if we all sort of sign up to that system, one, it will enable funds or royalties to get back to all legitimate people who sign on to this system, you know? And then uh, the, the companies, the big companies like Adobe who adopt that standard would then encourage users to participate. Whereas say with, with, with NFTs, there were so little protections that it created a huge backlash uh, Whereas, and even now, AI is creating a backlash. So it's in the interest of big companies to say we are taking measures to be ethical and to protect the artists. I think that would encourage more people to embrace it and get on board. So rather than looking at the punitive side and the policing side, perhaps the positive way is to look at all the, the voluntary side of it, where we as a society embrace a new system like that and we all, and then we, we ignore the people who, the people who violate it we just say, okay, you're out, you don't get your royalties, blah, blah, blah. We catch you, you lose out tough. So maybe it's as simple as that, you know, I don't know. I mean, but right now, it doesn't look like it's heading in that direction. It looks like it's heading more in a classic corporate direction where huge mega companies can acquire vast amounts of data very cheaply and then sell those as big package deals to their partners. It does not look like it's heading in a direction where individual creators will get royalties. That said, all that can change very quickly. These big companies could build their own system. I think that's what one of you was saying. Stable Diffusion should build that into their system. They should offer that royalty system, which I think would be really smart. The first one that does that, I think, will become really popular. And we're talking of which, on the gaming side, Epic Games has just announced using the Fortnite game where you can now build your own content but actually get paid so now you're not only playing you're paying to play the game which is well you, you only pay for upgrades you get you play the game free but now if you create content you could actually be a seller so i think it we're going to see more of that where big companies benefit from encouraging a sort of marketplace within their uh, ecosystem so Lots of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and Brian, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, 
I know it's kind of um, in your uh, area of expertise. So um, do you have any comments, questions? Yeah, sorry okay. about I'm a little rusty. I haven't been been in in the room in a while, but I this is definitely something in my uh, wheelhouse as recent as uh, I think it was when yeah Wednesday we had a um, all faculty uh, meeting around AI and. Uh, as far as art and design education, I'm a professional uh, industrial designer, specifically automotive designer and um, back teaching at the collegiate level back at my alma mater here in Detroit, uh, CCS or College for Creative Studies. And and um, I don't know if we really came to like, you know, like, you know, a, a solution, but just hearing, I mean, it was a huge Zoom call. It was a school wide um uh meeting and forgive me um background noise my son and nephew are playing but uh the the one one thing that i contributed that from my perspective one was um the overall i guess question that got the dialogue going was how do we integrate this in design education um for regardless of you know whatever major you know whether it's fine arts or ceramics or you know uh, industrial design um but how do we integrate it do we integrate it um do we ignore it um and for me hearing one instructor how she's already integrated it into her class uh, AI and, and, you know, mid journey and Dolly and gosh, what, you know, chat GPT or whatever, but, uh, she requires the students to, uh, provide in the research phase of whatever, um, uh, the project or assignment is all the prompts and, uh, basically lay out everything so she can track it. And then, uh, when it comes to the student generating their original work, it is not allowed. And I and I I was curious how you even track that. But two two things that um, came to mind for me was a have they asked the students? Have we asked the kids or the younger you know students what are their thoughts on it? We're at this other side as educators. And then two, since we're at the collegiate level and we're basically prepping the students to get into the professional art and design world, um, have we gotten any feedback on the other side, on the company side, on corporations or clients or customers? And how would that impact? And then the last thing that somebody brought up um, was that ethics can't be taught or excuse me, can, can AI, can that be, you know, is ethics and morality what's right and wrong? Can that be, um, uh, is that something that can be learned? Is that on us as educators or as adults or whatnot to um, uh, teach? And do we actually need a, um, a collegiate level course or maybe even further down the pipeline, maybe in grade school or elementary school so um yeah yeah that's just uh, i I'm, i really wanted to be here earlier and uh but uh, i'm glad i'm here now so thank you guys i think the ethics one is <laughs> it's got to be the most thorny one of all it's been written about insights so uh, by the way uh i nice see you again brian i remember we we ran into each other a while ago on here fellow designers Oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. I I used to dream of being an automotive designer as well. When I was doing my architecture degree, I actually told my professor that, and he said, "Oh really? Well, let's let's arrange a trip to the Ford Design Center." And that was very kind of him. So that was really cool. But in the end, I 
I didn't see that, but I don't know. I love it. So anyway, uh, I'm sort of somewhat jealous of your job, <laughs> suffice to say. But I've been enjoying doing video games and world creation and all that stuff. But back to ethics, I'm, all, I'm also a big sci-fi you know, person, so I've been reading science fiction projections of the future and, of course, going all the way back to Asimov's iRobots, a series of all these different robot stories, all delving into the ethics of AI, consciousness and morality and all the rest of it. It's been discussed so, so long by humans. And we're sort of now reaching the point where it's becoming something we have to grapple with. And I don't know if we'll ever solve it. I mean, one of the first problems I'm seeing with morale, trying to bit build morality into AI is it's so clunky. Uh, the, well, the first little example I ran into was I, I tried to ask the AI to write me a little scenario. I had an idea for a story, sort of detective story. And I said, it's going to begin with finding a dead woman in a hotel room and it immediately couldn't get past that it just said no i can't do anything that that conveys harm to a minority and i said wait uh, wait females are a minority aren't they something like 50.1 percent of the population <laughs> it's a well people who are sort of oppressed and marginalized would count as a as a minority and he said, okay so i can't include over half the population here in the, in this scenario and um, plenty of other examples like that, where it's uh, the intentions that begin as good, the ethical idea, the underpinning is well intentioned, but then when you try to sort of numerically build that into a computer system, it causes all sorts of really clunky outcomes. And it's not true ethics. The computer knows. And I grilled it. I said, "Do you really understand this, that, and the other?" And he said, "No." And at first it said, yes, I understand this, that, and you know, it described to me the thing. And I said, you're not, you're not understanding, you're describing me what the current human consensus is on that subject. And I grilled it and pushed it harder. And I said, are you sure you really understand it the way a human does? And he said, no, no, I, don't, I know I don't understand things the way humans do. I'm just taught by humans to have this uh, description of a, of a thing. So it knows it has no understanding and it knows it doesn't have any ethics and it knows quote unquote that it doesn't know anything it has no consciousness it's not self-aware it, it acts like it is it pretends it is we all know that but unfortunately some people don't understand that people are already falling for its sort of emulated personality people are already claiming that now it should have rights and stuff which is absurd you know with that move another asimov story was bicentennial man the moon, the science, which got turned into a science fiction film with Robin Williams, and it was about the first robot, sentient robot, and about struggled to get to get rights, and it went to court and everything, and it was like, I'm sure eventually that will happen, but the big problem is we'll never know what the threshold is between moving from what we currently call artificial intelligence, which in a way some people argue isn't even at that point, it's still just machine learning. Then we're going to get to artificial intelligence, which is sort of full emulation of human thinking. But that's still a difference between consciousness and thinking. When do we get to the point of actual consciousness? And in my opinion, they will all ever really know. It doesn't matter how well a computer can convince you it is conscious. It is ultimately emulating that idea. And that's going to be de hotly debated. And that debate, unfortunately, has already begun way way too early to be having that debate. Uh, but I'm digressing. It still doesn't answer how do we build an ethics. Now, they're trying to build an ethics. And I saw recently that Microsoft, I think, just fired their ethics team <laughs> from their AI project. And I don't know if it's because of that reason. They might have just realized building in ethics it just doesn't work. And maybe only the way to let it work is to let it interact with humans and let society's own ethics um, by uh, osmosis transfer into the AI. Don't know the answer. I'm not sure, Ralph, if uh, that will solve ethics, because then we are uh, we are assuming that some emergent property will come. You know, just like having absorb it absorb a lot of data. There's some emergence that happens, and mm -hmm. so I. But anyways, your uh, sci-fi reference, I. Uh, 
I, I don't know. You've seen Star Trek, right? So there is a mm-hmm. scene in this where a contradict contradictory statement makes the computer blow up. <laughs> I'm trying to find a gif. <laughs> I'm trying to find a gif for that, but I can't find it. Uh, and another thing, since you guys, well, I'm assuming all you guys are sci-fi fans. Uh, do you know why Hal killed folks in 2001 Space Odyssey of the crew? I have various opinions about it, um, which I'm probably a bit rusty now since I was delving into that most deeply. So years ago, after I saw the film, when I was fairly young, I read the book. And so the book gives you a lot better insight into what's going on. Most people try to understand the movie just as a movie and the plot line in it, but the book describes in more detail. So are you asking rhetorically because you already know the answer mm-hmm. or are yeah. you just curious about Um Can I just shortly interrupt and then we mm-hmm. can go on with the conversation? But Tommy, I know you have to leave. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And uh, thank you for doing this type of work. It's really important. And we, I know that you're working on already more preprints. Your pace of <laughs> your productivity is amazing. So congratulations, and we will follow your work. It's uh, it's wonderful, and um, thank you for coming. And we hope we, we hear you uh, back again once you have something new to present. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me, Katrina. I had a I had nice conversations today and like it's uh, fun listening to you guys too. Like I don't use Clubhouse at all. So, um, all right. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Like if any of you have any questions, like you can send me an email or like uh, send me a message on Twitter. Uh, all right. All right. Um, see you all. Bye. Bye. Enjoy Thank you very week. much. Cheers. Okay. Just followed you. Well, please you go good? on. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, uh, okay, so he uh, before the mission started, Hal was told that the secret plan that they have for the mission, nobody should in the crew should know about it. And there was another objective that uh, you should be truthful to the crew of everything they tell you, uh, you they ask you, right? So those are two contradictory statements. So Hal thought the best solution is to get rid of humans in order to remove that contradiction. So that's how I remember it. That might be something else in the book, Ralph, or you can. Well, that, that is the gist of it. Um, there's a slightly more, there's a little bit more of a plot point in the process. So what Hal ended up doing was they found itself in conflict uh, with its mission objectives, which is what you just described. And since the mission was given higher priority than the safety of the crew, it was stuck in a sort of ethical dilemma. And so it started to sabotage the system. So the first thing it did was created a false error on the radar dish, which prompted the one of the crew to go out and fix it. And then they found, oh, you know, maybe it was a false positive for the error, and then they wouldn't let him back in, blah, blah, blah. So you're correct. That, that's ultimately, it was a ethical conflict, which, which Asimov had already written many short stories exactly about that, where what happens when you give computers different conflicting directives. And then, in, in, by the way, in the Alien franchise, they stole that idea as well, the, mother in the first alien had the exact same moral dilemma uh, where it was considered the um, the retrieval of an alien species is higher priority than the lives of the crew same thing and so and then there was the film terrible film i robot (laughs) with will smith where they had the moral dilemma of if you're going to Two people are dying, they're falling into the sea and out of a car, and you've got a grown man and a young child. Which one's more important to save? The the robot has a chance to save one, but not both. Which one should it go for? And so there's so many moral dilemmas like that. And it's the same with auto, you know, self-driving cars. 
you're gonna you're gonna run into a pedestrian. What what do you do? Do you run? Do you turn left and hit the old granny, or do you turn right and hit the, the baby? What what do you do? There's so many difficult moral choices, which I you know I'm glad I don't work on those uh, programs here because it's so difficult. And to Brian's point, you know we, we need ethics. These machines are potentially incredibly dangerous. But designing those ethics turns out to be really difficult. And I don't claim I know any answers or any which is the best approach. I really don't have a clue. But <laughs> this is just a, a discussion, I guess. No, maybe I can play the devil's role here. Uh, I think, you know, with the advancement of uh, technology, humans might finally free from you know repetitive work and uh, have more freedom uh, in the near future uh, not uh, instead of thinking being destroyed by uh, by the, the current advancement i actually think it, it's it, it very likely to be a good thing for uh, for mankind I mean, that happens only if there is a redistribution of wealth. Without that, automation creates more problems than it solves. So it's a good thing for efficiency, but then, you know, it has to be accompanied by redistribution where, you know, the top 1% have so much that it lasts uh, their five, six generations, whereas the bottom folks, uh, you know, are struggling to have uh, food on the table. So without saying that the redistribution of wealth, because we have enough wealth in this world to really make a big difference. It's just the political will or culture or what you want to call it um, that always uh, kind of uh, comes in between. So I don't think uh, automation is like a silver bullet. Uh, unless it's followed by you know something uh, something along those lines some some policies yeah with uh, productivity increase i think we're not far away from uh, you know we can support everybody's uh, uh, you know uh, basic living oh, we are uh, there now demands. we are there now we don't yeah, need productivity yeah right so we are we are already yeah. there so you know uh, I'm imagine a you know a near future. Nobody has to worry about you know survival related stuff. And even though we are kind of there, but you know most of people are still you know they have to uh, work just for living. And uh, I think you know the I actually think the solution to that is by increasing productivity uh, and that productivity is not by working harder is by uh, you know uh, technology and so free humans from uh, you know many of the kind of more meaningless uh, work uh, right now you know people find the meaning in work but maybe that is the wrong thing of doing but steve there is a... so there are certain works like people in tech like you know i'm assuming you're in tech, I'm in tech, or everything that tech touches, there are other folks who are outside of those industries, right? And, uh, okay, yeah, there is a noble goal of freeing everybody from work, um, but then it should come with, like, what I'm trying to say is the top 1% uh, make, say, a couple of billion a year. I mean, that's some percentage of that is enough for a nation, you know, in most cases. So, um, yes, I, I like this idea of like freedom and, you know, somebody's doing your job or maybe whatever, how you're sustaining uh, your lifestyle and all that. I, I don't know how it's going to happen. Like people have visions, but they, there is no steps in between. It's just a jump from quantum jump from A to like Z. And uh, uh, the intermediate steps are which are, which are important actually.
Anyways, I digress. Yeah, I think it's an interesting discussion, and um, I think the 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 importance of discussing all these different issues um, is really, you know, we 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 should do that more also in public. And I would like to see politicians discuss these type of topics more. How do we implement? How do we regulate? AIs, robots, and so on, automation in the future to have like still economy because also for governments you need um, income tax to kind of afford uh, also their jobs, politician jobs at some point. And if everyone, everything is automated, um, you know, all restaurants and, and everything. You know, those are the people that actually pay taxes, right? It's the it's not necessarily the Google or Amazon. Jeff Bezos right. is, you right. know, the everyone stupid person <laughs> that goes to work every day. And uh, yeah, if if nobody makes, you know, has an income anymore, they don't have a job anymore. Like nothing works. So there has to be a regulation. But I feel like. It's very similar to what everything happens. There's like some emergent recession then going on. I don't know, like income tax uh, breaks down completely at some point. And then we will make some weird, you know, patchwork uh, to fix it. And that's then what we go with and not like real plans that were discussed and, you know, made in a sensible way what do you think i i feel like that's always what we do yeah it's it, it, i think it, it, in the other room that i go into sav and he, he that's his point that i'm making here is uh, he says a cultural change is needed right like um, one example i'll give is uh apple ceo tim cook when all these uh layoffs with tech started happening apple hasn't had a single layoff uh, he took, I think, 40% or 50% pay cut. Uh, he gets a couple of millions a year. Uh, so uh, he's trying hard to not have that uh, sort of layoffs for the folks, uh, the effects to come downstream ra rather than being absorbed upstream. So that sort of, uh, I don't know what should we call it, culture, leadership, um, you know, thought process is needed rather than like oh you know maximization of uh, more like 100 times more than that's already needed uh, to have a pretty awesome lifestyle so um anyways yeah that gets into the politics but uh, this notion earlier i used to believe too like oh automation is going to make everybody free and you know, kumbaya, everybody dancing, and you know, every nobody's working, everybody has enough. But it should come with this also, right? I mean, if systems are taking care of the work we were trying to do now, uh, that distribution of wealth has to, you know, as you said, governments are there, they have to run, taxes are there, you know, yeah, anyways. Yeah, I, I agree that there has to be a shift of, you know, how you identify yourself. A lot of people, at least in the U.S., identify very much with their profession. And, you know, that's kind of who they are, which I think will be easier in other countries where the, <laughs> the happy moments of life are mostly free time and not your work. <laughs> And you're very happy if you don't have work. <laughs> so, I think it will be that will be like a psychological thing, but I I don't believe to be honest. Like you know, look how polit governments in general are working. They kind of constantly try to uh to 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 uh, this is extinguish fires. Not too much is really planned ahead well. So I think only a real shift will happen if shit hits the fan, basically. And then 
it will be a really not very sensitive sensitive like you know plan will be okay let's distribute more food stamps and you know get taxes from those then those leave and then nothing is there anymore and then i don't know i i don't see it happening unless something really like what should happen is there should be discussions about this all the time and then come up with you know a plan that makes sense but will that work like let's say you go ahead now either as a republican or democrat or in any other country and say okay this will happen we will have to give out a lot of money and you know just we still afford schools we still will pay for schools but we won't really need educated people to get income tax we just do it out of because we are democracy we need educated people that can read and so on so so do you think people will vote uh, people will say i'm not paying taxes so everyone will get free money and you know so it will only work once everyone that is important enough is out of jobs and universities will crumble down because nobody is willing to pay tuition anymore you know only big lobby big lobby when those are affected like big lobbies then something will happen like law uh, lawyers you know big universities things like that because you know why spotify started to exist and pay musicians it was because musicians were on the most of them were on the contract back then from big companies that had a lot of influence also on politics so they had kind of that backup why artists don't have it right now and why nothing is happening is you know all these artists that put their images out there don't have a lobby behind them it's just everyone fends for themselves basically and that's why it's going way slower than it was with spotify and napster and so on i don't know does anyone have something else they want to share and add if not We'll uh we'll close the room soon. I'll have to get around to get dinner, but well, thank you so much. This was a really great discussion, and I think this is really important work. And I'm glad that um our guest speaker came because I think that type of work will be really important to make these decisions and, and add real data, real facts to those um, discussions for the future. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming um, to, uh, yeah, to contribute and, you know, to make all these references. It was a really fun discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing, Katarina. Yeah, and yeah, if you like discussions like this, as you know, uh, come back uh, next week on Wednesday, we'll have Dr. Klein and how stem cells decide to die or regenerate. There's kind of a switch and uh, the, the scientists will, Dr. Klein will talk about that switch and how to influence that. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry for the background noise and happy weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye.